your Bibles, let's take a look at God's Word today. Go to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. We're going to teach today about wisdom for your life in a confused world. Say, wisdom for my life in a confused world. All right. Proverbs chapter 9 Verse 1 says that wisdom has built her house. This is the New Living Translation. Wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. She has prepared a great banquet mixed with wines and set the table. She has sent her servants to invite everyone to come. She calls out from the heights overlooking the city. Come in with me, she urges the simple. To those who lack good judgment, she says, come and eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. Say, thank God for the house of wisdom. See, it's the very premise. The very premise of the message is quite simple. To live to have wisdom for your life in this confused world, all you have to do is move into and live in the house of wisdom. So Lord, help me to see and to move into and live inside of the house of wisdom. Now, if you look at the text, it says plainly wisdom has built her house. Now, when God wants to make something very important and powerful, he oftentimes, the word of God is, will personify something or someone or some concept. Now, when you personify, it means that you make something as if it was a person. You give that, you give that concept, that person, you, give, you animate that. For example, we see the Disney movies. They will personify animals, like Lion King. Animals are talking, you know, and uh, Simba and you know, all those, you know, all that. Now, animals don't talk. Come on now. But we give them, we, we personify these, these animals in cartoons to make them more important, the more relevant. Well, God is personifying wisdom and he's using a woman. Amen? We like women, right? I like my wife. I love my wife. <laughs> I listen to her. You know, matter of fact, in, in, in fighter pilots, jets, when they have voice prompts, for example, the jet's going down, you know, flying too low, says pull up. It's a woman's voice in the jet because the woman's voice, it penetrates, and you hear it better. And we like women. <laughs> I mean, you know, guys, you know, right? In other words, everyone, everyone relates to a mother type one, the matriarchal sense, so that the woman's voice is very powerful and very important for us. Therefore, wisdom is personified as a woman as a very good woman, and says she has built her house, carved the seven columns. That means it's a good house. It's a nice house. It's a nice crib. All right, how about that, okay? She has prepared a banquet, right? I mean, you know, a good woman's going to feed you, right? <laughs> going to take care of you. You're going to be fed up in there. And says, and mix the wines, set the table, and now invite and send invitations to come and dine. So the houses, the table set, door is open. Wisdom says, come on in. Come into my house. Now, I'll tell you something. You need to go in that house. Say, I need to go in that house. Say, neighbor, say, neighbor, you should go in that house and stay in there. <laughs> because the house of the world is full of madness and confusion. Always been that way. You know, maybe you think it's worse today. Well, it's always been crazy out here. It's a confused world. Confusion, by the way, y'all, confusion's a bad deal. I mean, confusion is just not like uh, not being able to make a decision on one or two things. Confusion is a very deep problem, whether it's on the inside of people whether it's on your job, in your school, wherever you go, I mean, confusions are a bad, a bad deal. Matter of fact, the Bible says 
that, I mean, when there's like envy and, and things going on like that and sin, there is confusion in every evil work. Confusion and evil go together. Confusion has friends. Come on. Got little friends like madness and silly and goofy and all that. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you. Wisdom got some friends too. We're good. When it comes to that, wisdom, wisdom got some good friends. But confusion has friends. So listen, when you go outside the house of wisdom, you can't find anything better outside of what God offers you. I'm telling you, I tried I try years ago. I tried to find someone, something better than the Lord. Couldn't find anything. I just got myself more in trouble, more messed up. And it says she calls out. And says, from the heights, from the heights. See, wisdom, wisdom is, 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 is not just some place you can't hardly see it. Wisdom is in plain view, in plain sight. In fact, chapter 8 of Proverbs tells you wisdom is at the intersections in the city. Wisdom is at the gates and the doors. Wisdom is where you have to, you have to walk right by wisdom. You have to not want wisdom. I'm saying, I mean, some things are so simple, you must have help to misunderstand it. I mean, some stuff is like it's right there. It's just right there in front of you. And wisdom is like the wisdom is right there. Wisdom, is, come on in, come on in, come in here. You know, we got a little cat, a little, a little cat story. I know black folks don't like cats, but we like. I'm a cat person. I like cats. Okay? Cats are cool. Dogs are dirty, okay? Now, watch this now, in my opinion, okay? Now, listen, we got a cat. Cat goes out on the porch, screen porch. Stays out there as long as he can. Nice out there. So Pat goes out there to get the cat, bring the cat in. Cat, little cat, come on in. Cat's like just sitting there, lay over, follow, go upside down. Don't want to come in. Pat said, come on. Pat said, come on. She walk out there. He get he lay lower. You know, he go low. You know, like you know, you can't. I'm I'm getting make myself heavy. You can't pick me up. I go out there and say two words. Get in. Cat jumps up, runs in. I say, get in there. Get in. He just gets up, runs in. See. So I'm telling you, you know, you want somebody like me. You want wisdom telling you get in. Get on in there. You need this. Get in there. Get in. Go in the house. You know, because it's going to get cold out here. It's going to be storming out here. If you stay outside, you're going you're gonna to suffer for it. And okay, sometimes here we're outdoors. Here we're out, you know, when it gets dark. The game is try to get out. He's a house cat. So the game is get outside. So if you open the door up, he'll do, he'll actually, he'll back up to make you think going away from him, he'll back up and then rush the door. All right, you come in the house, he'll, he'll back up as if he wants you to see him backing up. And then when you look away and the door is open, he'll rush out the door. That's the game we play, all right? So then he gets out sometime, and then, you know, it's getting dark. He's, not a, he's an indoor cat. He can't survive out there. He's not an outdoor cat. So we have to go find him, or at least call him. We know where he is, right? He's over there under, under the car. He don't go very far. Watch this now. So we're saying, Riley, come in, come on in. And he'll just look at us and come halfway and go back. So Pat's out there calling him. I'll call him for a minute. But one night, I had a, I had a big day the next morning. I had to leave early somewhere. I couldn't be out at night calling this cat. And Pat had to work. So we're like, you know what? Cat gonna stay out tonight. I mean, we, we don't have time to be up, you know, calling this cat. Cause he know where we are. He know, he know, he know the game. The game is you call me, and I'll come when I'm ready. That's the game. I'll come when I'm good and ready. Like, like, like people, you know, like like we do sometimes. We tell God, I will come, God, when I feel good and ready. So that night, we closed the door. Locked the door, went upstairs, and went to bed. And sometimes I'll get up in the middle of the night 
and go call the cat. Not this night. I had an early morning. That cat was out all night. Now, for our cat, that's a big deal. You know, for alley cats, that's normal. But for our cat, to be out at night is a really big deal. Left him out there. So I get up at 6 a.m., and I go to the door, and I call his name, and I hear something go, yeah, 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 yeah. And I see some streak, <laughs> some like streak running into the door, into the house. He came, he came flying into the house, <laughs> wailing, wailing and running into the house. I'm like, that'll show you, that'll teach you. So I'm telling you, you know, it's like behavior. It's amazing how sometimes we act like creatures of the world. We know where we're supposed to be. We know we're out too long, too late. God is, God is calling us. Now, God won't stop calling. He won't leave you. But God will just let you sit out there for a little bit. Because sometimes, you know, my theory is, my children know this and church kids know this. We love all of our kids and my kids, your kids. But if you get your behind locked up, you're going to be in there for a minute. We're not going to raise no money to get bail. You're going to be in there for a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I don't have $1,000 to waste on getting you out of jail. You know, amen, somebody? Amen. Trying to help y'all out here. Little cousins and them, all them, hooking them. Let them sit up in there for a minute. Like my cat. He won't die. They'll feed him. They'll feed him. They're going to get fed, too. Amen? See, sometimes, you know, the house of wisdom, we don't value the house of wisdom until we don't live in the house, until we experience enough time away from the house of wisdom. We need to understand that God gives us wisdom for life. We don't have to, we don't have to go through certain things. Some stuff you can't avoid. You can't avoid the price of gas going up. But we can avoid something. We can actually avoid a lot of stuff and avoid all the trouble we get ourselves into. Amen, church? Amen. So wisdom has a house, live in it. Say, Father, help me come to your house and live in the house. Now, in the text, he's talking to two kinds of people here. And the call went out, and it said, first of all, it says, for those who are simple, those who lack good judgment, it says, come in. So the first kind of person wisdom calls out to are those the Bible calls simple, or we say simple-minded. You might say naive. The, he the Hebrew word for simple means without pause. It means to be easily persuaded and enticed, unskillful, easily confused. There's a lot of things in this world that want to confuse you. There are even, you know, sometimes even the marketing mechanisms of our world try to confuse. I watched a commercial last night. Uh, the Samsung had this thing, a great, beautiful commercial about the curved TV. A curved TV. I'm telling you something. This thing is, is, a, is a beautiful photography and the angles and the curved TV. You know? Got to have you a curved TV. Now, I'm aware of this thing. It's been out for a while. But listen, y'all, curved TV ain't nothing to it. I mean, in other words, it's even worse because when you're sitting like at an angle, you know, part of it's like scrunched up. You know, it's like, it's, you know, you can't, it's like, whoa, what happened to my picture on the side? So it's curved. Now, if it were like a movie screen curve as big as a room, that's one thing. It's a regular old TV, 50-inch curve. <laughs> you got to have the curve. Now, there's no, it's not even better. It's not even better. The image quality is no better. It's HD, HD, whatever. It, it's just a regular HD TV. But it's curved. And so what happens is they want to sell you on the hype. So you go buy one to your friends. I bought a curved TV. We're going to watch a movie on my curved TV. That's called, that's simple-minded. Now, if you got a curved TV, excuse me, don't, don't get mad, don't, don't be offended. I'm trying to tell you, a curved TV is not better. Even, the, even you go to the cinema, the best cinema in the world is not curved, it's flat. My point is, do you see how that if we're simple-minded, we'll fall into thinking, i got to have a curved TV, why? Because it's curved. Is it better? No. 
So don't be confused or persuaded or gullible without pause. Just rush in for a lack of wisdom. Amen? That example, before the crash of 2008 and 2009, economic crash, part of the reason for the crash was a lot of bad credit went out. And one of the tricks in this whole thing was people were earning, like, for example, say, $25,000 salary, but then go buy a house for $200,000. But the hook was they had it packaged a certain way where the, where the payment the first year was $100 a month. Folks like, oh, man, I can get a $200,000 house for 100 a month, not month, a month. Oh, yeah, I'm in. Sign the paperwork. Just sign off on it. Now, the way it was back then, I mean, people, people were simple, and the lenders were playing on the simplicity. And it's still going on today. It hadn't stopped. But so then, but the fine print said, after the first 12 months, the payment goes up to 2000 a month, 1500 a month, whatever it was. It's going to go up because... That little 100 bucks a month was, a, was a, a hook to get you to sign that note. So that's, listen, y'all, we don't want to be simple. We don't want to, without pause. You got to pause. See, I'm going to pause and check this out. That's what wisdom does. So again, there are examples all around us, y'all. All kind of examples of people getting, getting caught up for a lack of wisdom. We're talking about how to have wisdom for your life in a confused world. You get the idea now? Now, look at Proverbs chapter 1. And, in fact, I was looking at this this week. We're going to have a 30-day devotional starting October 1st. I've already got articles written, but the Lord gave me direction to change the direction of the 30-day. We're going to do Proverbs every day, a proverb a day. Yeah, we're going to do Proverbs. Not the whole book, but I'm going to select a few verses and do a commentary. and make the, So that's going to be the change for that, all right? Because there's so much in Proverbs that we need. And this thing about the house of wisdom is a very important point. It's a powerful principle, living in a house of wisdom. But it says in chapter 1, verse 4, the purpose of the Proverbs, he says to give prudence to the simple, to the young man or young woman, knowledge, and discretion. Everybody needs to learn prudence, learn how to sort things out, how to make sense of what's right, what's wrong. I mean, all of us need to have the ability to, to look at life and know what choices to make. And listen, y'all, we don't have that ability built in. We don't come with built-in wisdom. We don't come, we're not born with wisdom. In fact, Colossians, rather, Corinthians says, Christ has made unto us wisdom, among other things. So that wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from sources that are bigger than us. Amen. We have to learn wisdom, like you learn everything else in life. Amen, church? And so he says that the purpose of Proverbs, then, is to give that wisdom, that knowledge, that discretion and so that when you abide outside the house, you can never get into the wisdom of God. That's why there's so much foolishness going on in and around our world. Even believers in Christ who get caught up in the world and outside the house of wisdom are going to find themselves confused in the confusion, being affected by the confusion. So that we want to get a real good picture here and be very clear about what we need, what, we, what God is saying. You know, outside the house of wisdom, we get impressed with stuff that's shiny, loud. Come on now. We like shiny, loud stuff. If it's shiny, it must be, if it's loud. See, you know, no, no, sometimes the best things are not shiny at all. Amen, somebody? I mean, sometimes the loudest person is not the smartest person, you know. Rarely it's the loudest person. I mean, the, the things that we are most, imp the curved TV, I mean, the things that just seem to impress you may not even be the best things for you. Correct? And so that in the house of wisdom, we learn how to see things clearly, learn how to assess what's happening and be 
and have wisdom to, to look at situations, even people, and be clearer about what we would do, what we should do. A lot of times, think about, you know, we have this divorce rate, 50% of marriages end in divorce. 80% of second marriages in the divorce. Here's the, but here's the crazy part. The marriage rate among Christians and folks in the world is exactly the same, 50%. It's the same divorce rate with, quote, unquote, church folk. I say church folk versus Christian. I think true Christians do much better, although we struggle too. Here's the point, though. Think about this. Now, you go back and look at what happened and how a marriage goes bad. What maybe have, have happened was this, is that sometime we are meeting people outside of the house of wisdom. Huh? So then, if we're outside of the house of wisdom meeting people, and they're outside the house of wisdom, <laughs> and you crazy a little bit, they crazy a little bit, you combine crazy, it don't get better, it gets worse. Because you got to be crazy to want to date somebody who don't even know God. Right? You got to be a little crazy, okay? Right? And then the person who don't know God, they crazy in their own way. And so that, you, you know, say, I do. All right, you did. And now y'all together outside the house of wisdom. And, and look, it's a confusion. See? So we have to understand that there's no perfect people. We're not perfect now. I'm not telling you, look for a perfect person. That's, that's impossible. I'm just telling you that sometimes we can analyze and look back. You know what? Yeah, I messed up because I did this thing. I decided this thing outside of the house of wisdom. I agreed to something, signed up for something, put my name on something outside of the house of wisdom. And so she says, she says, if you're simple minded, if you, he said, come on in here. Then she said, look at verse five, uh, Proverbs nine. Look at this. Verse six, leave your simple ways behind and begin to live, begin to live. You're not living until you're in the house of wisdom. I mean, I mean, living the life that God has for you. He says, begin to live and learn to use good judgment. Say good judgment. good judgment. Not just judgment. Everybody got judgment. We need good judgment. Everybody can judge, assess situations. We need to have good judgment that come from God the house, in the house of wisdom. So there's the invitation. Come on in. Come on in into the house, because there's horror stories outside the house. Amen. There's weirdness outside the house. It isn't always just evil and bad, but it's just not good. It's, just, it's not going to ultimately end up in your favor. Even stuff that look okay ends up bad. I remember I was shopping with, with Jonathan for a car some years ago, and we saw this car. Now, the, the, they're, you know, they're all kind of car lots, new car lots, used car lots, and, you know, I mean, some people have a used car lot and sell good cars. Some people don't. You don't know sometimes. Well, we saw a car. It looked real good. car looked really good. The price was amazing. <laughs> amazing price, you know, for this car. And so he wanted to finance it a little bit, you know, get some, get some credit, which is okay for cars if you do it short term sometimes. Listen, but... We found out that when they pulled the title, it had something called a salvage title. Everybody say salvage title. What is that? Well, listen, y'all. Now, there are cars. All cars have titles, right? Certificate of, you know, car, you know, ownership, where it was made and all that. But then if a car gets in a wreck or gets in a flood or something happened to it and, it's, and, and the damage is more than the car is worth, it gets written off. And when somebody buys that car, whether it's an individual or a car dealer, they have to give us a, a, a different kind of title called a salvage title. Now, this car then is identified. This car, it, it may still run, probably will run, but because it's been on the water, <laughs> there can be some issues to manifest later. You know what I'm saying? Like it rusts up and fall apart underneath you. Also, found out my research that 
Sometimes cars get sawed in half and put back together with a different half of the car. And that gets sold. Take the body off, saw it in half, put it back together, sell it. It's a weirdness. It's a strange. And listen, y'all, in this world, it's some stuff going on, all right? Now, so this car, we found out, we looked at, had a salvage title. And nobody going to finance it, look at you, and help you with a car with a salvage title. You just buy it cash, take your chances. And it might, be, it might work out for you. They aren't all bad. Price is low. Now, what the problem is, though, sometimes dealers don't tell you the car has a salvage title. There's no law to say you got to tell people it's a salvage car. It's buyer beware. So someone had a great idea. Some years ago, they started a company called Carfax. Now, there many companies like that where basically somebody, you, you pay them a fee because they go out, they do the research on that car. They go back and check the history and dig down deep and pull in records and find out where this car has been. <laughs> so, so now, you know, I mean, that company's done real well and many others have spawned off of the concept, but the concept is great. So, you know, I, I can't trust a guy who's selling me the car, so show me the car facts. Show me, the, show me the history of this car. And so once you see the history, you think that it's salvage title. Or say it's the bottom of the river for five days. You know, came out of Katrina, you know, somewhere like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it happens, y'all. As long as you know. Now listen. So what happens is if we don't have wisdom, we'll jump on stuff. It look good. Price is low. And then even say, oh, praise the Lord, stuff like that. We got all excited about stuff that's not even what it seems to be. But I thought this this morning. I thought this. You know what we need to have? <laughs> we need to have a car fact for people. Before you date that young man, show me the car facts. <laughs> I want your history. Now, there's no history like that. But you know what you do? We should check folk out, though. I mean, you know, yeah, he might be nice and she might be cute, but they might be crazy. And crazy tends to run in families. <laughs> tends to. Now, sometimes folk get saved and they break out. They break the mold. Amen. But it do tend to run in families. And, and if it doesn't, I mean, listen, y'all, just know that if you marry that person, you marry the whole family. Anyway, so then talk about crazy uncle showing up and all this here. So show, say, show me the car facts. <laughs> or better yet, just listen, y'all. Listen, just stay in the house of wisdom. And there's no perfect people in the house of wisdom. And because somebody's family's crazy, I mean, that they crazy. You can't just judge on that. I'm saying just use wisdom. Because sometimes God will show you, man, my life has changed. At some point in my family history, my, fa my dad, my mom, their parents, I mean, they all serve God. But I'll tell you something, you keep going back, you're going to find somebody did not serve God. So then if it, if it is a family issue, hey, let it stop with me. Let me change the direction of our family. Amen? Say, I would change the direction of my family if I need to, by the grace of God. That also happens to be a function and a benefit of being in the house of wisdom. Say good judgment. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Now, Jesus says something very much similar to what Proverbs is saying. Because God, it's the same principle. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come in the house. Come to me. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you see this? He says, come to me. Take my yoke. Now, this thing of the house of wisdom and being outside the house can also be likened to yokes. Now, yokes is something that we don't have any, you know, we in the city have no idea what that is, but a yoke is basically what they use to link 
together oxen or the animals in the farm to make them pull together. Pull. So you, you know, put a yoke on this one, yoke on that one, and they, you know, all string, uh, all strapped together, and they pull something, plow, whatever. So they yoke together, pulling, right? Well, we all yoked. We all are yoked to something and somebody. Everybody got a yoke. Just a matter of, you know, if it's good or bad. Jesus says, take my yoke up on you. Take his yoke. Now, sometimes when you yoke up with people, you think you're getting in there, you know, <laughs> to have a good time, but, but sometimes you get dragged around because <laughs> wherever you, <laughs> you're going with whomever you yoke with, unless you get to pull. If you pull stronger, you can pull them with you. But if they're stronger, then you get pulled around behind them. I mean, think about that picture. You're yoked together. You, you, you are together. You, you're yoked. You put your head in there. They close the clamp the thing down, and now you're in there. That's, a, that's, you know, that's a good Now, I'm yoked to my wife. That's a good thing. But I've been yoked to stuff and people in the past. That was a bad thing. All right? Some of the guy I got in this guy's car. Now, listen, y'all. Getting somebody's car and they driving, it's a yoke. <laughs> Say it's a yoke if you're not driving. And I got in this guy's car outside the house of wisdom. If a house of wisdom was the other side of the world, for me, okay, back then. And so we, he, he go driving, the firebird. And the guy began driving real fast and crazy. He lost his mind while he was driving. Why, lost, why, why he, was driving, he lost his mind while driving. Driving to the streets fast, turning corners, spinning out, crawling up on two wheels. I'm over there looking at this guy like, I'm in a car with the devil. Well, I was the devil, two devils, but this devil's driving. And then the guy stops the car, we get out. I told you a story, and he's, we're going to this, this club, and this guy is karate kicking dents in people's cars. He's karate kicking cars all the way from the parking lot to the joint. And I'm with this fool because I got in his car outside the house of wisdom in a yoke. You climb in that car, think about it. You ain't going to jump out when it's running. So then, just illustrations that come to take, he says, he said, take my yoke. Christ said, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke. Take my other yokes off. Take off those other yokes hmm, and put on my yoke and learn from me. So you're going to learn from Jesus best when you're close with him, when you're hooked up with him. I mean, you can drop by church and read the Bible now and then, you learn a little bit, but you're going to learn a whole lot more when you're actually with God and the things that, and the people of God. You got that? For I am gentle, he says, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Man, there's no rest. There's no rest outside the house of wisdom, hooked up with somebody, going the wrong way. There ain't no rest in that situation. He says, and my yoke is easy. Because it's easy because he's carrying the main load. He's pulling most of the weight. He's pulling you along with him. Jesus Christ, in his yoke, he brings us along and, 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 and brings us through all the challenges of life. That's why it's easy, because he's doing all the work. And my burden is light. What he asks you to do, you can do because he's with you, helping you lift that load. Amen, church? So then, just like I said in Proverbs 9, wisdom has invited you in. Christ says, come on in. The message could not be clearer. Let's come on in. Let me give you now some points. Some points on, I'll just call this, i just call them uh, blessings of wisdom. Say blessings of wisdom. Number one, wisdom gives you a firm foundation. Go back to Proverbs 1. Turn there in your Bibles. Have a look at it. If you have your Bible with you. We read this earlier, part of it. But it says, verse 1, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. The purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline and help them understand the insights of the wise. The purpose, it says, going on, it says, 
Uh, we read this in verse 4, to give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Now, a proverb, by the way, is a maxim. Now, maxim is something that's always true. It never have to be proven. Always true. We use maxims in mathematics, right? Maxims, maxims in science. So a maxim is, for example, we have to say uh, everything goes up must what? It's called gravity. It's a maxim. All right? To get uh, to measure from, from where I'm standing to the, to the doors back there, what's the shortest distance between me and that door? Straight line. That's a maxim. It's always true. Proverbs is like that. Proverbs are maxims. When you read it, you get these little statements, little brief statements. We read several to you already, and those little statements are there's a maxim. So the Proverbs is a collection of those statements, of maxims. And those statements, the Word of God, it gives you insight. Then it says in verse, in verse 5, let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. That's the second kind of person I meant to mention. The first kind of person was a person who's simple-minded. But he's also talking to people who already have wisdom but need more wisdom. Going to a higher level, level level, okay? Next level type stuff. He says, it says, let, the, let those with understanding receive guidance. So if you understand, now you can get more guidance, get more direction. He says, verse, verse 6, and by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Figure things out. You figure things. Life, is, life has riddles, y'all. You know, sometimes people bring me things to look at. Sometimes some kind of investment scheme, whatever. And because of wisdom, in five minutes I pick up on stuff. Like, okay, that's a pyramid scheme. Damn, that is. That's multi-level marketing. Ain't always illegal, but just so you know what it is. That if you get in a pyramid scheme, you down the bottom. You ain't get no money. You get like you know. You get to make money for somebody else. Only folk at the top make money. And they're telling you get in, get in while you can. Yeah, get in, cause you know that you gonna get my money. I ain't getting none of yours. <laughs> cause I'm at the pyramid is shaped like top, wide, bottom. So you come in the pyramid, any place but the beginning. You just fodder. You just you just a pawn for the game. See? So, you know, again, with wisdom, it's a riddle. Pyramid schemes, it's, it's a riddle. You get to figure stuff out. You get to just, God helps you see stuff before you get into stuff. Amen? Amen. And avoid all his regrets. Here's the second point, seven blessing, the second blessing of wisdom. The first blessing was it gives you a firm foundation, a strong place, foundation to, to build your life on. Second, that wisdom keeps you thirsty. For God's best. Say, Lord, thank you for making me thirsty. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2. Look at this. Again, we'll have these type of statements in our devotion, okay? But Proverbs 2, verse 2 says, Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. That's good all by itself. He says, Cry out for wisdom, ask for understanding, search for them as you would for silver, seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will become, uh, you understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain the knowledge of God. In other words, you become thirsty. You actually, you will want, you will want what God has for you. You want more of it. Tune your ears. You know, we used to have, have to tune the radio station. Now it's all digital. But back in the day, quote unquote, we had these big old knobs, and you turn the dial, and you get close to the station, you begin to hear the station. You turn a little more, and it got clearer. And then the high-end amps had another knob. <laughs> he had two knobs. He had one knob just to get there, another knob to fine-tune. And you lock on that station to come through real strong. You got to tune, you got to tune yourself. You got to tune in. You got to tune in to this, to wisdom. Because God, see, God, God has a problem. He thinks he's God, which means he won't follow you. He won't accommodate you. He might, he might not, but he, he, he thinks he's God. He is God. So, he, so when God says something, he's like, you should be listening to me. 
It ain't arrogance. That's just it's nature of being God, right? Because he's not wrong. You're not smarter than God. That's a weak amen. Say, I'm not smarter than God. I want to make sure we understand this now. You're not smarter than God. And so that, he says, tune your ears, see, which means you, you have to learn to what to pay attention to and what to tune out. Hmm? I was in a barbershop, and uh, the barbershop's a funny place now. I don't like going, but I need my haircut, you know what I'm saying? But so I, I do appointments. I don't walk in. I, I, I need give me a time. When I walk in, I'm going to the chair. You know what I'm saying? I can't be sitting around there. But I was in there in the chair being serviced. You know, it's a good barbershop, too. Uh, but, you know, guys talk. So one guy was in there. One guy was up in there trying to sell, selling lunches. So he's like in there. He wants to, I mean, he wants to basically you, he'll take your order and take your money and go out and get your food and bring it back to you. Not a bad idea, except the way he went about it was crazy. You know, he was talking trash and stuff, you know. So one guy, I mean, people, <laughs> one guy came in with his little lunch. And then one guy said, you got any silverware? Another guy said, he don't need none. <laughs> he don't need no silverware. He just, he's, you know, he's gross. And so, but one guy, fellow, he got, the barber next to me, he got gypped out of his money. So he was mumbling under his voice. Now, my barber's a Christian. He said, man, keep your spirit straight. Keep your, don't, don't, don't let that get to you. He said, he get mad because the guy took my money, and he came back with some food and he got mine. Basically, you know, he's just like, he's, you know, he's cutting hair and he's mad. It's a drama, a little low-level drama, you know. <laughs> Stuff happened at the barbershop, all right. And so I told, I told both guys the story of Nabal. You know, Nabal was the man that, that offended David. Remember that? And David got mad and said, I'm going to kill Nabal. But, but Nabal's wife was named Abigail. Heard about it and said, and went to David and said, David, please don't kill my husband because he's a fool. And Nabal means fool. David, please, I know you're mad, but please, you know, you're destined to be the king one day. Why should it be said, on the way to being king, you killed a fool. So the thing is, y'all, you can kill a fool. It's just not worth it. So I said, I said don't kill the fool. I said to the guy, don't kill fools. He's being a fool. Don't kill him. Don't just let, let it go, man. So he heard me. My barber, you know, he heard. They, 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 he calmed down. He calmed down. He got all calm. And then, and then the guy came over to him and gave him back his money. Yes, that worked out, right? So I gave them some wisdom. See, I was in a house of confusion. See, the barbershop. <laughs> but I live in a house of wisdom all the time. I don't care where I am. I'm in the, somebody, I got some sense wherever I am. I mean, I'm going to bring some sense in there. If I have, if, I'll try to bring some sense up in here if I get a chance. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm, I'm there to be a light. Help that guy. He was, he was getting hot. He was getting hot. He was steaming, man. Like, I'm, you know, something's going to happen up in here, you know. I helped him out. Amen? <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't get his food. So you see that, that when we have wisdom, you can, when you tune your ears to wisdom, you can tune out foolishness. Number three, the third blessing of wisdom. Wisdom shows us how to listen and overcome obstacles. Amen. Wisdom shows you how to listen and overcome obstacles, and major on majors. That's an old phrase. Don't major on minors, major on majors. Don't put your mind on stuff that's like silly. Put your mind on things that's important. Proverbs 4, look there. Look there, please. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 10. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long Good life. Some folk live a bad, short life because they don't listen to anybody. They won't listen. Uh, we're going to play a video down. Uh, this is a video I want you to watch. It's very deep. Check it out.
Howdy, Granny. Jethro, finish my sweeping. I gotta go someplace. Uh, no, ma'am, Granny. What? Sweeping is women's work. You go cut me a hickory switch and you wait for me. Granny, I told you before, there ain't no hickory switches, nor woodsheds in Beverly Hills. No wonder they have to have policemen to watch the young'uns. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna bite on that one again. I'm too smart. Is that a fact? Yes, ma'am, Granny. Uncle Jed says it's because I go to school. <laughs> You're much too smart for a poor old woman that ain't had no school in her nothing. <laughs> yeah. That'll be the day when you can outsmart your old granny. <laughs> So wisdom, you think you're smart, be careful of that now. You know, wisdom teach you how to listen, okay? Wisdom will tell you how to overcome obstacles. And so it says, my child, listen to me and do what I say, and you will have a long, good life. Verse 11, I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. Say straight paths. When you walk, watch this, when you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Do not let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Say instruction is the key to life. If you can instruct somebody, you can help somebody. They won't listen to instruction, you can't. Your very presence doesn't help people. Just being there is one thing. It's good. But if folk won't listen and heed instruction, you got you to back up off them a little bit. Because they have to experience the consequence of their own decision sometimes before they realize, I should listen to instruction. I don't know what I'm doing. It says, Proverbs 16, 20, it says, those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. Now, who doesn't want to prosper and be joyful? Everybody wants that, but you have to recognize to get there, you must get to the house of wisdom. We have to let the wisdom of God instruct us. I'll give you one more. I've got several more. One more I'll give you. Let's look at um, Proverbs. Well, I got well, two more. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs will teach us about the power of success through diligence. Make no mistake, God wants us to succeed. No doubt about it. Proverbs 6, verse 6 says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. This is a New Living Translation. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. He says, learn from their ways and become wise. I said, here's your assignment. Go watch ants. Go watch ants. He says, he says, verse 7, though they have no prince, no governor, no ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands, and then poverty will come upon or pounce upon them like a bandit, and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. <laughs> so lazy folk, man, they get in trouble. You know, when they have opportunity, won't take opportunity, you know, they invite, they invite trouble. So wisdom will teach us the power of success through diligence. The final point is, um, uh, look at Proverbs 11. Wisdom will teach us about the blessings of sowing and being generous. Sowing to reap and to be generous. Proverbs 11, look there. This is this one of those things, those principles that seem backwards, opposite what the world would say, what people would say in the world to you. But it's confusion out here. It's clarity in God. Verse 24, Proverbs 11 says, There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right. 
but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will himself be watered. You would think that, if, okay, if I have 10 of something, and I give away like two of them, all I got is eight now. So let me hang on to all my 10 and never give up. No, actually, if you don't give and release, it actually tends toward poverty. That people who are not generous, people who, uh, who, who don't help and serve God and help other people, actually, they trend downward. Their, their, their trend of blessing and even provisions naturally tend to go backwards. When you do not give and you hold everything in, it makes it worse for you. It's like this. <clears throat> If you have, let me describe the C. Let me describe to you a C, a, a C that has no water coming in and no water going out. What's that C called? It's a dead C, and there's in fact a C called the dead C. Nothing lives in it. Nothing lives in it. Because it's, it's, it's the way it's situated, it, the rain, it may rain on it, but because no fresh water comes in, nothing comes out, everything stays, it, gets, it, it, it becomes salty, it becomes toxic, and nothing can grow in it. And when we don't have, when we're not giving out and receiving new, we become like a dead sea. And over time, nothing lives. I mean, it, it, it's backwards to the wisdom of the world, that when I give, I receive, but, but listen, like, the whole world, the whole system works that when you, when you sow, you reap. That's just the way it works. And so the Bible here says that if there's one who scatters, yet increases more. I cannot explain to you or have time to tell you all the instances where I have personally, when the church has been sowing and giving, and, and God just somehow keeps blessing us in return. Just things, blessings come our way. I mean, it's not even by design. It's just by obedience. Because the ministry with this few members shouldn't have a building at all. We got a building almost paid, well, almost uh, a couple of years. I mean, I mean, everything, so, you know, it don't seem possible. But when, you, but when you serve God and you give and you sow, you know, it's a mystery, but it's God's mystery at work in your life. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. But then it says, but there's one who withholds more than is right. You don't give all your stuff away. I don't give all, you can't give all your money away. But, but listen, when you withhold more than is right, it leads to poverty. So we should be, be giving God at least a tithe and an offering above that. Then verse 25 says, the generous soul will be made rich. Now, I know a few rich people personally, and they are all generous people, and did not start being generous when they became rich. You hear what I'm saying? They've always been that way. And I've known some people, I've, I've watched them come up, and I've, I've got one brother of mine right now whom, who, whom you don't know, but this brother, you know, we're the same age, he went to Purdue, and well, he went to college, became a lawyer, and I just say this much, it's I can share this much, but he's this brother, he's African American brother. He's one of the he's one of the top. He's in the top twelve of all sports agents. I'm talking about he has Deion Sanders in the past. Some guys now. I mean, this brother's like really rich, okay? And he's really generous. Now you can't go up to his house and say, "Give me something." I don't mean like that. He ain't stupid. That's called stupid. You don't, listen, y'all, here's the trick. You don't give nothing to stingy people. Let them, just be, let them be stingy and broke until they figure out wisdom, get into the house of wisdom. But listen, but, but, but people who are rich, I mean, believers, the ones I know personally, the few I know, they're all generous people. And I consider myself rich. Amen. I do, I mean, compared to <laughs> some folk I've seen. So, so these, this is all wisdom, people of God. This is information, insight, wisdom for your life in a world of confusion. So let me say to you, let's, let's hear, like the Proverbs said, let's listen and let's do. 
Let's come into the house of wisdom. Let's take Jesus' yoke upon us, and let's see how much God will do with us, for us, and through us. Amen, church? Let's all stand. Praise God. Thank you, Lord.